Good evening, everyone. It is now 7.02, and we are going to call the Board of School Directors legislative meeting to order. At this time, I'm gonna ask everyone to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to and the, the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with, liberty with liberty and, and justice, justice for all. all. Thank you, everyone. Ms. Evans, if you can do the roll call, please. Yes. Ms. Franzik. Present. Mr. Henderson. Present. Ms. Ionetti. Present. Dr. Levinowitz. Present. Mr. Robsky. Present. Ms. Sherpier. Present. Mr. Sirota. Present. Mr. Wallach. Present. Dr. Davis. Present. All present, thank you. Thank you very much. Again, I just wanna welcome everyone uh, to our legislative meeting. We do thank you for taking time out of your, your busy schedules, particularly this time of the year, um, to be with us and participate and support the work of our school district. So we have a pretty hefty agenda, so we're gonna get right into it. Um, we're going to welcome uh, Mr. Daniel Kaplan back. Um, we sort of said goodbye last week, but he's here to introduce a very new special person to us. So, Mr. Kaplan. Yes, uh, as I did promise last week, uh, last week was my last meeting, but I do have the honor of introducing Joyce Jung, who is a junior at Upper Dublin High School and will be taking over for me for the next year. So, welcome, Joyce. Um, and we are thrilled to hear your first speech. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel and Dr. Davis. Uh, to personally introduce myself, my name is Joyce Jung, an Upper Dublin junior this year, and I'm so proud to be able to serve our students and faculty as the next school board representative. I know the great responsibility that comes with this position and will work hard to become the communication and liaison for all of the school activities and happenings between the students and the board. As the SGA completed another successful year of elections, we have some new and returning members to our student government steering committee, beginning with our president, Aaron Muth, Lauren Howey as the vice president, Samir Young in the activities chair, Ari Weiner in spirit, Emily Marshall in community service, Nitin Valibu as secretary, Ben Serafin as policies and procedures, Sneha Chaudhary as school improvements, Willow Kaplan as treasurer, Luke Price as information and commerce, and Anthony Soriano as underclass representative. We anticipate a high quality upcoming year, putting our faith in the new steering committee board. With that, I want to start by thanking all of the volunteers for their hard work in organizing the vaccine clinic this past Friday held in the auxiliary gym, arranged to offer both the first and second doses to our students. With all the dedication, I'm confident that we are successfully working towards a more normal school experience for the upcoming year. In terms of a more normal experience, this past Saturday was a night to remember for the seniors as the PTO and parent volunteers commemorated a successful prom to celebrate the last few weeks as an Upper Dublin Cardinal. Our seniors, however, will always remain a Cardinal in our hearts. Although the end of the school year seems near, AP exams are still high in sessions with students and teachers working hard to achieve those high scores and guide the students to success. For the underclassmen, the keystones await them this coming week as well in June and we send our support and best wishes. While on the topic of accomplishments, we have some exciting news from the girls track and field team who received the title of Suburban One League Liberty Division Championships this past Saturday as their season came to a close. We are also very proud of the Flying Cardinals boys volleyball team as they won their first SOL division championship in the history of the school. We congratulate all of our hardworking <laughs> athletes and cheer them on for the remainder of this season. 
As the school year comes to a slowing halt with only a few days of the year left, students and teachers alike are excited to end the final quarter strong. Thank you all for listening. And although I'm still very new to this position, I assure you that I will work hard to serve the board and my fellow classmates. Have an excellent night. Well, thank you very much. We definitely want to welcome you. We're extremely excited to have you on board. Um, your first um, report was very complete. And um, for all of us, we are always excited to hear what's happening at the high school and all the wonderful things that the students are involved in. So thank you very much. We look forward to getting to know you and to having you participate with us each month. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Yanni um, for his superintendent's report, as well as several presentations um, that he's gonna give this evening. Dr. Yanni. Thank you, Dr. Davis, and welcome, Joyce. We look forward to having you as our student rep uh, at meetings in the future. And as Dr. Davis said, your first report uh, was great. And again, we give a heartfelt thank you to Daniel for his service as student rep. Um, to begin my superintendent's report tonight, um, there was a discussion at our finance committee meeting last week about a PTO donation from the Fort Washington PTO um, for an outdoor classroom. Um, Mr. Lester, our director of facilities, is currently working with the uh, PTO representatives on gathering some more information. And so that um, information and that um, recommendation will um, come forth on a future finance or legislative meeting agenda. The district recognizes the need um, for a strong and coherent K-12 social and emotional wellness program. Um, we've identified a program for our elementary school students and we're currently reviewing options for our secondary schools. Tonight on the agenda, there is a motion for Mind Up for Life uh, Mind Up for Life is a signature program of the Goldie Hawn Foundation, a not-for-profit organization created in response to the global epidemic of childhood aggression, anxiety, depression, and suicide. Mind Up for Life, Life is based firmly in neuroscience. Um, it gives kids the knowledge and the tools they need to manage stress, regulate emotions, and face the challenges of the 21st century with optim optimism, compassion, and resilience. The district plans to use MindUp, as I said, in our elementary schools beginning in the fall. And we're grateful to the Upper Dublin Education Foundation for its sponsorship of the program. In the coming months, you'll hear from us about a program that we are looking at for our secondary schools. Tonight, we are uh, honoring members of what I call our one team. Um, I call our staff in Upper Dublin one team um, despite position or title, we're all here working for the same purpose, and that is uh, to make our school district and the education we provide for our students excellent. So tonight we have a number of individuals that we will be recognizing. Um, because we're not in person right now and because we want to do something special for these folks, we will be uh, inviting all of um, the folks, the names that you're about to hear, um, to a dinner in the fall where we will recognize them at a meeting and also um, share a dinner with them. There are a number of folks who are celebrating their 15th year of service. Those are Linda Bickley, Kim Callahan, Danielle Costelli, Dee Cross, Shannon Doberstein, Matthew Dorneman, Don Edelman, RJ Farina, Sarah Farrell, Morgan Funston, Tony Giamarco, Daniel Greenberg, Ann Hammond, Vanessa Hooper, Christine Hoppelmazium, May Wong, Amanda Cavanaugh, Kevin Kelly, Joe Lacombe, Jen Lazinski, Rhiannon Linmar, Mary Jane Lyons, Joseph McGoldrick, Daniel McNamara, Tree Milrod, Brian Pestridge, Rebecca Reap, Jerome Robinson, Christy Richter, Beth Schulman, Kathleen Starosta, Michael Sussman, Jason Trantis, Ming Chuang, Katie Wenger, and Mitch Will. For 20 years of service, we have Kate Allen, Maureen Broadbent, Donna Dahl, Kathy Dashoff, Lisa DeVito, 
Christopher Hayden, Maureen Hayden, Paul Johnson, Jeannie Kellogg, Hannah Kim, Bonnie Lerman, Peter Ann McCall, Robert Miller, Maureen Palazzo, Keith Smith, Davida Hennigan, John Squarey, Brian Stout, Jennifer Vogel, and Sandra Wish. Celebrating 25 years of service, we have Cindy Bigelow, Ellen Fullerton, Virginia Heiss, Jill Lynch, Brenda Ritchie, Charlene Wykenot, and Melanie Zemicelli. We have two individuals celebrating 30 years of service. Those two individuals are Susan Myers and Randy Winheim. And last but certainly not least, we have uh, James Forlini celebrating 35 years of service. We also recognize a number of retirements this evening. Philip Borthwick, Transportation Department with 12 years of service. Mariana Brocchio in the business office with 11 years of service. Rose Budakoffer, Elementary uh, Band with 30 years of service. Patty Calistri, uh, Occupational Therapist with 13 years of service. Lisa Green, Spanish teacher at our high school with 23 years of service. Robin Griffin, who was an administrative assistant at our high school with 11 years of service. Judy Grove, who uh, worked previously at Thomas Fitzwater in our main office with 21 years of service. Colleen Hayes, transportation with 14 years of service. Sue Hausman, uh, Fort Washington and Maple Glen, or I'm sorry, Fort Washington and Thomas Fitzwater, nurse with 29 years of service. Arlene Jeshenik at Fort Washington with 22 years of service. Ruby Marberstein, previously at Sandy Run and then at Fort Washington with 15 years of service. Meg Place, principal of Jaredtown Elementary School with 26 years of service. Lynn Priebus, art teacher of the high school with 23 years of service. Alice Rasmussen at the high school with 17 years of service. Kathleen Riley at Upper Dublin, 18 years of service. John Rogers, art teacher at the high school with 33 years of service. Emmanuel Rook, transportation with three and a half years of service. Kim Schuler, uh, an administrator formerly of the high school, 32 years of service. Cindy Shapiro with seven years of service at Jarrettown Elementary. Jennifer Tooley with 27 years of experience. Uh, she was an art teacher at the high school. And Howard White, 17 years of service in the transportation department. We congratulate all of our uh, employees that are celebrating milestones and years of service. And we also wish all of our retirees uh, well as they end their service with the district and begin their next journey of retirement. As Joyce uh, mentioned, we're very thankful um, for the vaccine clinics that we've had in the district. We're particularly thankful to Wellness Pharmacy Services in Montgomeryville for their partnership. Uh, we've had two successful clinics at Upper Dublin High School, and we're having another clinic this week, and that one will be at Sandy Run Middle School. Um, the Pfizer vaccine being uh, approved for students ages 12 and older, um, that by the end of the school year, all of our students ages 12 and older will have access to the vaccine. Tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. on the district's YouTube channel, uh, you'll be able to watch the 2021 Upper Dublin Medals ceremony. We will make sure that that is, I may have said tomorrow night, it's Wednesday night. I'm sorry if I said tomorrow night. It's Wednesday night and the link um, will be available on our website and uh, you're also able to get it right from our YouTube channel. And finally, registration um, for the upcoming school year is ongoing. Um, all of our registration materials are online and we look forward to welcoming our uh, new students, not only in kindergarten, but in grades uh, one through 12 as well as we come back to school in the fall. That concludes my report. Um, and Dr. Davis, if it's okay, I will move um, into the two presentations that we have um, this evening. Absolutely. Thank you. So um, Ms. Evans, the demographic study, thank you. From time to time, districts engage in enrollment data, projections, and demographic studies. Um, we took the opportunity this spring to engage with George Sundell of Sundance Incorporated. And I'm going to walk through the results of our enrollment data 
and projections um, that are an outgrowth of the demographic study that uh, he completed. So if you can go to the next slide, Ms. Evans. So I have three goals for this presentation. The first being to review the current demographic study. Um, next, to compare the current uh, demographic study with the data from the two previous studies, the two recent previous studies that the district um, has had done. And that's um, namely the Montgomery County Planning Commission um, and that was done in 2017. And the Pennsylvania Department of Education projections, and even though the district doesn't necessarily ask the department um, to do projections, every few years they release um, updated projections. And then at the end, we'll talk about um, how we'll be using enrollment data and projections in some long range uh, planning. Next slide, please. As we go through um, the presentation tonight, uh, let me make this comment. The full uh, demographic report will be available on our website tomorrow, and it's also going to be part of my superintendent's report that we put out on, on social media uh, and email to the staff. So um, the, the methodology used in the demographic study is something called cohort survival. So how students move from one grade level to the next and how those groups stay together or not. So as we talk about the data tonight, the data is predicated on six years worth of actual enrollment. And then the demographer uses um, things like live birth rates and um, housing projections in, um, in our case, Upper Dublin Township, along with cohort survival to make some uh, projections in terms of enrollment. Um, cohort is a name given to common groups of children uh, originally born in a given, given year and how they progress uh, from one grade level to the next. And for um, enrollment projections to be valid, it's mandatory to use the same data collection system at the same time each year. So as we go through um, this presentation tonight, I will also address how we'll update these numbers over the next couple of years. Next slide, please. We talked a little bit about the cohort survival ratios. Um, and as we go through, I'll explain those in a little bit more detail and how those ratios um, affect our projections moving forward. Um, but the, but um, for those data gurus out there, um, a survival ratio really indicates whether enrollment is stable, whether it's increasing or decreasing. Um, and you'll see that as we go through the presentation tonight. So Ms. Evans, you can go to the next schedule or the next slide. So if we do a high level overview of Upper Dublin Township population data, the demographer gave us um, several data sets. So you see there preschool children, school age children, um, individuals that are of childbearing years, individuals that are middle age, and then seniors. And if you look at the data, and compare from 2000 to 2010 and then to 2019, we saw in Upper Dublin Township the largest decrease um, among school-aged children and the largest increase in those individuals who are seniors. Um, and the demographer took this information into account um, as he looked at how our population is going to trend over time. Next slide. The demographer noted something that is not atypical um, of any community. It's actually very typical. Um, and that's the township composition or municipality composition um, in other districts. So uh, one third of households in Upper Dublin Township have school aged children, uh, and two thirds of households do not have um, school aged children. But again, this is not unique to Upper Dublin. This is pretty, um, a pretty common statistic and fact that you see across municipalities um, across the Commonwealth. What you see on this screen um, are snapshots, screenshots from um, the demographic study. Um, right below the text, you will see residential sales um, and how those changed from the year 2008 to 2020. You'll also see um, the residential building permits by types. 
Um, and the demographer used the data that he was able to get there to make some assumptions about how those uh, types of permits and how that building in our township is going to impact our enrollment. And then also the demographer worked um, closely with the township um, to get data on the various developments that um, either are on the books or soon to be on the books um, in Upper Dublin. And what I want the board and the community to know is that as these uh, communities come online, we will be tracking the number of students that um, we see from these communities. Um, by way of data, promenade, um, right now we have one student um, attending Upper Dublin schools from um, families that moved into, um, into the promenade. But we'll be keeping a chart that we'll share periodically of the number of students that are coming to our schools who live in one of these um, areas of new building and new growth. Ms. Evans? As we go through the uh, enrollment projections, you are going to see that the year that is noted by the demographer is the October um, is the is a date in October that we do something called a PIMS snapshot. PIMS is Pennsylvania Information Management System, and it's all of our student data um, gets uploaded to PIMS, and that becomes a repository from which we do um, all of our enrollment data, our attendance data, our uh, things like PSS ordering PSSAs and keystones. So when we see, for example, that the demographer projects that in 2021, we're going to have 3,920 students, what the demographer is really saying is in school year 2021 and 2022, um, we'll have um, 3,920 students. And I just mentioned that because um, in EduSpeak, we don't normally see single years. We usually see school years broken out. As we look at the projections tonight, we will see three sets of data. So we'll see actual data. So that's actual verified data from our PIMS report, what's reported to the state. And then the demographer gave us five years of projections. And generally speaking, those projections are fairly accurate. The demographer and most demographers then give you another set of data and that's in an extended period. As you get into those um, years, so if you think of projected data five years out and then extended data six through 10 years out, um, as you might imagine, um, those numbers tend to be a little bit less accurate. So it's important um, over time that we update our studies. And in fact, we opted to go with Sundance and George Sundell to look at how his projections um, would match or not some of the other projections that we've gotten um, over the years. Next slide. So if you take a look at our K to five, our elementary enrollment, I have noted here that um, after a period of relatively stable elementary enrollment, um, we saw our enrollment shrink. Um, so if you take a look at um, 2019, which is 2019, 2020, you see there um, we had an elementary population of 1,807 students. For 2020, which is the 2020-21 school year, we see we have um, an elementary enrollment of 1688. Now we know there are some factors there. Some families left us for private school and cyber charters um, because of virtual instruction. So um, what we will do is we'll watch these numbers closely to make sure that as students re-enroll with us, which is already happening from cyber charters and uh, from private schools, we'll update these numbers a little bit. But it's also important to note that as we look at projections, a one-year dip doesn't throw everything off because again, the demographer is using six years worth of data to obtain averages. Um, so if you look um, for 21-22, um, we're projected at the elementary level to have 1680, 1,680 students. And you see that um, it remains relatively stable. And by relatively stable, we're talking about within about 50 students for a couple of years. And then um, what we're starting to see in 24 and 25 is 
um, some increased elementary enrollment. Um, and as we look at each of the buildings, you'll see um, due to some housing turnover in the Thomas Fitzwater catchment area, we start to see Thomas Fitzwater um, elementary school grow a little bit. So Ms. Evans, you can go to the next slide. I wanna point out that as we look at the projections for each of our elementary schools, it's important to note that each of our elementary schools remains under capacity now and into the future. So all the way out through 2030, our buildings are not filled um, to capacity. Um, we often hear things like every room is being used in a school or there's no space in a school. And that's because we have space in our elementary schools to be able to afford um, staff like reading specialists and special ed teachers and some other programs like the YMCA and others, some full-size classrooms. So um, it's not to say that we're flush with space because we're not, but we're comfortable in our buildings right now. Jarrettown being um, the building that is um, the most quote unquote crowded, but even inside um, that word crowded, there, there still is some space at Jarrettown. You'll see that Fort Washington um, is projected um, to steadily increase a little bit over time, um, and, but it stays relatively stable. The same thing can be said uh, for a while for Jarrettown, although um, we start to see Jarrettown get a little bit bigger. We see uh, Maple Glen remain relatively stable, um, but we do start to see a little bit more growth at Thomas Fitzwater than at our other elementary schools. And so those of you that have been looking at enrollment for some time, Thomas Fitzwater is always um, our building um, that is lower in enrollment than our other schools. Um, so we do see, um, based upon the projections from the demographer, we do see Thomas Fitzwater uh, start to grow a little bit. Um, Ms. Evans? At Sandy Run, um, we've, we start to see a little bit of volatility in enrollment. So it's obviously a little bit easier to project uh, middle school and high school enrollment because you're not um, dealing with the, the, you have more years um, without looking at kindergarten. Kindergarten is always the wild card. So we see some volatility in the numbers at Sandy Run um, Middle School. Um, you'll see in 2020, we were at 932 students. So that's this school year. We're projected to have 916, 901, and then it, it stays relatively um, consistent. But then as you see, if things progress the way the demographer believes, you'll see in that extended period, we start to lose enrollment and then we start back up on an upswing. And if the demographer is correct, and if we continue to update numbers based upon the trends we're seeing, we'll see a high of enrollment out in year 2030 of just over a thousand students um, at Sandy Run. We really see Upper Dublin High School go completely the other way. So if you look at 2015, which was the 2015-2016 school year, we had um, a, a high of um, 1469. And as you'll see, those numbers um, have decreased over time. They start to remain a little bit steady, but then as you'll see, um, we start to see the enrollment at the high school really go down. And that is because we have um, several years where we're graduating more students than we're bringing in in kindergarten, right? So the incoming group of kids is smaller than the outgoing or the seniors. Um, but again, we'll be right around that 1300 number um, for the foreseeable future, give or take. Um, next year, we're projected to be at 1324. Um, five years out, we're projected to be down around 1287. But overall, for a high school um, of our size, of the, the population, the numbers are relatively stable. Um, but it's something to watch um, and update the numbers over time because then we start to see um, the enrollment go down. And if we look from the starting point of 2015, to 2030, we see quite a significant drop um, in enrollment at the high school. Ms. Evans? 
um, elementary, um, I'm sorry, the overall district enrollment has decreased over um, the past couple of years. So if you look back at 2015, uh, 2015 was um, the, the high point at 4,187 students. This year in 2020, we we're um, at, on October 1st when we did our PIM snapshot, we were at 3,955 and we're projected to be um, at 3,920 as we start school uh, in the fall. Now, again, um, we'll have to watch this number because um, again, we had families leave us this year. We're starting to re-enroll those families um, and we'll be cognizant of that. Um, and when we met with the demographer last week, um, um, he talked about really the necessity that all school districts are going to have to really update their numbers because many public schools regionally and across the Commonwealth saw uh, a bit of a, a fall off of enrollment. So we'll continue looking at um, this. And so what we'll do at least every October is compare our actual enrollment with the demographer's projection. And then we have the formulas and the math needed to be able to update, update those numbers. So what I anticipate is you'll have, the board is having this presentation tonight and then um, enrollment projections will be part of uh, conversations again in the fall um, and then in the winter and in the spring each year as we, as we uh, do some long range planning. Next slide, please. What I did was I included the information that the district received in 2017. So in 2017, the Montgomery County Planning Commission did um, an update of enrollment projections um, and they ran three scenarios. And those three scenarios are uh, base birth rates. So that is um, based upon the average of live births over a period of six years in Upper Dublin Township. Then they ran scenarios with higher uh, birth rates. And what they did was um, they made some assumptions about younger families and housing turnover, um, having more individuals come into the township that are of child uh, bearing age. And then they ran a third scenario that said, what's going to happen if we have higher birth rates and we make adjustments for housing because we know there's going to be a little bit of, uh, of building. When you look at um, the enrollment projections and let's take this year. So I'm looking at school year 2021. Um, this enrollment projection was looking at um, 4,033 students um, in both the base uh, birth rates and the higher uh, future birth rates. And then when it was adjusted for housing, um, we saw that go up to just under 4,100. So um, what that tells us when we look at um, these projections versus um, the Sundell and Sundance report, um, they're not that far off. They're not identical, um, but it gives me a little bit um, of confidence that um, both the information we had previously and the information that we received with our newest report um, is, is fairly accurate, accurate enough for us to do some long range planning. And then Ms. Evans, if you go to the last slide, um, these are the, um, the enrollment projections that are done by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. What I will tell you is that the Pennsylvania Department of Education projections are rarely accurate. Um, if, so if you take a look, um, they took our actual enrollment in 1920, which was 487 students, and then they ran our projections. And if you look at the projections out in school year, 2029-2030, uh, they're projecting Upper Dublin to have a total enrollment of 4,622 students. That is a significant increase in enrollment. Um, what the Department of Education does as they um, do their enrollment projections is they look at continued building in an area and continued turnover of housing in an area whether there is building to be had and, and housing turnover um, to be had. So often 
or I should say almost every district looks at the Department of Education projections as a data point, but not at a data point um, that gives us any type of accurate information. Um, and so there, these projections are included in this presentation just so that you can see the difference between what we got from Sundance, what we got from the Montgomery County Planning Commission, and then what PDE says so that um, the board, the community, anyone that wants to look, you can see the range, um, the range in projections. So to wrap this up, so we have uh, Dave Hoffman, our chief academic officer, says when it comes to data, there's the what, the so what, and the now what. So the what really, so now we have demographic data and enrollment projections that we need to do some long-term planning. So if you think about the work that the district has engaged in um, over the last couple of months, we did a facility condition assessment, which outlined, um, uh, I guess about $40 million worth of work to be done over you know, a, a period of 10, 10 or so years. The other piece of data that we needed was what's our what's our enrollment going to look like? Were we going to see really steep um, increases in enrollment? Were we going to see precipitous decreases in enrollment? Or are we going to stay relatively stable? Um, and some of you that are listening might be saying, well, you know, the demographic study basically says you're going to stay stable and, and anyone could have predicted that. But I will tell you, um, if you look just to our neighbors in Bucks County, there have been some um, districts that have been very surprised by um, the enrollment increases that they have received in some of um, and some more densely populated areas of their municipalities. So we have the demographic data, so we understand what enrollment is going to be over the next five years, and we have a little bit of a view in what it's going to look like um, in years six through ten. And this data is really um, needed so that now we can take the, the facility condition assessment data and we can now take the enrollment data. And now uh, members of our administration and members of our board can sit down and look through um, the facility condition assessment and say, how do we prioritize the work that needs to be done in our district so that we not only have accessible buildings and safe buildings, but buildings that are appropriate for um, 21st century learning. And I, I know that's a, a bit of a buzzword, but how do we create instructional spaces that are conducive to the type of teaching and learning we want happening in our classrooms? So with that, uh, Dr. Davis, that was an awful lot of information. I'm happy to take questions from the committee and the, or the committee, the board, um, before I do the second uh, presentation. Um, so if, um, if okay, that's your will, I'd be happy to take questions. Are there any questions for Dr. Yanni at this time? I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, I think they're going to have to digest all of this. Um, I'm sure we'll get some information um, to review this again, and we will follow up with questions at that time. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Ms. Evans, if you go to our next presentation. So tonight you will see that there are several um, motions on our agenda. Um, there is a motion to abolish some administrative positions and there are motions to create two new um, leadership team positions. Um, when I came to the district as a superintendent, one of the things that I was charged with doing was laying out an entry plan where um, we would look at all facets of the district and make the changes necessary to continue to move the district forward and really do um, make our strategic plans really actionable. So um, what we're going to talk about here this evening is um, the third and final part of our leadership team reconfiguration. Um, and I'm calling this leadership for uh, continuous improvement. So. Uh, Ms. Evans, if you could go to the next slide. I really have two goals in this presentation. One is to review the current and new leadership structures for the Office of Teaching and Learning. So the teaching and learning is our, our curriculum folks. And so we'll talk about what is 
and what will be as we move forward uh, into next year. And then we'll also talk about our rationale or my rationale for making the recommendations that I'm uh, making um, this evening as reflected in the motions for the agenda. So um, the board hears me use this term um, all the time. I call it the executive leadership team. In some districts, it might be referred to as the superintendent's cabinet. But our executive leadership team makes up um, seven individuals. So um, we have our superintendent. We have our chief academic officer, Dave Hoffman, Ashley Kitten, our director of HR, Andy Lechman, our CFO, Prakash Patel, our director of innovation and technology, Meredith Penner, who currently serves as supervisor of teaching and learning, and then Dr. Rita Perez as our director of student services. And on this executive uh, leadership team, we're going to make a change. So Ms. Evans, if you go to the next slide. So I've highlighted our teaching and learning um, team. And um, when you take a look at this, you will see that I'm recommending um, that we change Meredith Penner's title from direct uh, supervisor of teaching and learning to director of uh, teaching and learning. Um, I wanna put a caveat on there for the folks that might be listening thinking that um, there's a large salary increase that comes with a change in title. Um, there's actually not, um, but Meredith works on our executive leadership team and she will be supervising or helping to supervise some of our um, other supervisors, um, supervisor of STEM and supervisor of humanities. And so uh, pragmatically um, and in terms of having a correct organizational structure, we're looking at changing her title from supervisor to director of teaching and learning. Uh, Ms. Evans, next slide. So in our office of teaching and learning, we have a chief academic officer. We have a supervisor of teaching and learning. So we have Dave Hoffman and Meredith Penner. And then we have a number of folks that live in two worlds. We have folks that spend part of their day as administrators and part of their day as teachers. And Upper Dublin is unique in that, um, in that respect. Um, there, I'm unaware of any other district that has folks live in two worlds. And while it's great to be uh, unique in some ways, this is not the area that you want to be unique in. Um, it's very difficult to be someone's colleagues, periods one and two, and to be their supervisor then the rest of the day. Um, I do wanna say our supervisors, our curriculum supervisors, these changes are not being made because of performance concerns at all. What we're doing is we're looking at creating a more effective and efficient um, supervisory structure. So Chris Horn is our allied uh, arts supervisor, Brina Vandergrift as our um, supervisor of English, Meg Kowalski as our supervisor of math, Lisa Fantini, uh, supervisor of Robbins Park, Kim Small, supervisor of science in the planetarium, and Tony Giammarco, um, so, uh, supervisor of social studies. These folks will still have jobs. They will just be in the teacher's bargaining unit, not as part of the administrative structure of the district. And um, to ensure that there is no misconception out there, um, not only do these folks have jobs moving forward, um, the planetarium will still be uh, run by Ms. Small and uh, Ms. Fantini will still be running uh, Robbins Park. So it's, we're not, as we're making these changes administratively, we're not removing those pieces um, from our district. Um, what we are looking to do in a new leadership structure is to go from that list of individuals to four individuals that um, are going to be working um, together as a cohesive unit um, and create some better K to 12 alignment. So we will have our chief academic officer, which is Dave Hoffman and our director of teaching and learning Meredith Penner. This evening on the personnel report, the board knows that I have two recommendations naming a supervisor of humanities and that's Brina Vandergrift who was previously our English supervisor and uh, Chris Michener, who is currently our associate principal at Upper Dublin High School, serving in the role of supervisor of STEM. Again, just to be clear, the um, curriculum supervisors 
Um, the previous curriculum supervisors on the left-hand side of your screen, they retain employment, but they retain employment in teaching positions. Uh, next slide. So um, with everything, I always like to provide the board with some rationale for recommendations that I'm making. So um, what this uh, new structure does um, is continues the right sizing that we've um, done in the past. So as superintendent, I believe that we should be matching our staffing levels to the size of our district. So we've talked about in the, in the past, we've, um, we've not replaced positions. Some people would say that we cut positions. Um, during my time here, we've been very clear that any positions that we don't replace, we're not cutting them, we're not getting rid of a program, we're simply matching staff to the size of our district. K to 12 alignment is something that has been a real work in progress for the district. So having a uh, supervisor of STEM and a supervisor of humanities um, who also see um, the arts and fine arts um, will allow us um, to do some comprehensive and cohesive curriculum work across all levels um, with writing and STEM integration. Um, I'm very excited about the work that Dave Hoffman uh, is doing and getting uh, ready to propel forward um, in terms of a uh, comprehensive and coherent writing structure of K-12. We know that writing is typically a weak spot in uh, districts, and it's an area that if we tighten up our practices in writing, we will see um, some of the soft spots in student achievement uh, improve. And then uh, finally, the third point of my rationale is really to maximize efforts to achieve proficiency um, that, uh, of students as we've outlined in our strategic action plan. So I've been very clear that I want 100% of our students reading on or above grade level by the end of grade three. I want 100% of our seventh graders uh, proficient in math. And by the end of eighth grade, I want 100% of our kids um, proficient in writing across all domains. So by realigning our teaching and learning uh, department and having these four individuals were K-12, I believe that we're going to be better positioned to do that than we are uh, at the moment. Next slide. And that brings me to questions um, on this item or on this presentation as well, Dr. Davis. Okay, once again, um, to the board, um, are there any questions for Dr. Yanni at this time? I see Mrs. Uh, Franzik's hand up. Thank you. Um, really just more of some, some comments, um, Dr. Yanni. I think this has been a great evolving process and it's something that I appreciate you and your team's strategic sort of outlook on staffing that has spanned a number of years um, in terms of the right sizing process. The one thing I really appreciate is that the reduction of sort of the overall number of positions really allows for that focus on our strategic plan and the, the initiatives that you had mentioned around literacy, but also just sort of generally um, having fewer people um, sort of working on that strategic side allows us to really get people into the classrooms and doing the work of teaching. Because I think we've learned something this year that it's really difficult to kind of have your attention split. Um, and I think that's uh, something that has always sort of challenged Upper Dublin since I started on the board, people sort of doing lots of different things under their, the mantle of their position. So I just think from an, as an educator, I truly appreciate this and uh, thank the team for moving this direction. I will say to Mrs. Francis's uh, point, um, we will be down a total of three administrative positions uh, with this reconfiguration since 2018. And so if you think we started, um, my leadership team when I uh, was appointed and arrived was 41 um, individuals and we'll be down three from that. But I also believe um, maximizing efforts to move forward. So thank you, Mrs. Francis. Thank you. Uh, I see Ms. Scherfier's hand. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I do I do um, support this this um, realignment. I do think it's it is very difficult for um, supervisors to wear two hats, especially being a colleague, but also being a, a, a leader and 
perhaps an evaluator. So to, to clearly uh, separate those tasks, I think is good. But I also really want to thank the current supervisors in all the different areas for all the hard work they did, because they certainly stepped up uh, in many ways. And um, I want to thank them for that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sirota. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on um, what I think are two of the strongest points of this plan. One is that we do see that K-12 integration across the board. Previous supervisors, most of them, uh, everything except arts uh, was six to 12. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm also looking forward to um, less siloing of the department. So uh, by having uh, curriculum coordinators be or supervisors be in this be be focused on multiple things. Hopefully, we'll see greater crossover between uh, things like you know social studies and English, uh, or you know pick any two. Um, so I think those are two really uh, strong points of this plan. That um, in addition to uh, headcount and uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, so it's not just about headcount, but I think it's about better outcomes. So I'm looking forward to that. I think to that point, Mr. Sirota, we will go into the comprehensive planning process that's required by the state in the fall. And so those four individuals will be pretty critical as we um, look at the goals that we already have in place through our strategic action plans and how we refine that so that we truly move away, that we're not moving away from silos just on paper through our organization, organizational chart, but that we're really moving away from silos and the actions that we carry out and the curriculum work that we do and the professional learning that we engage in. So I think that's a really important point. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions or comments at this time? Not seeing any additional hands. Again, thank you, Dr. Yanni, for all the presentations uh, this evening. Um, I don't think you've ever been on the um, mic this long um, when you're from superintendent's report to presentations, but it was a great deal of important information, um, particularly to highlight how we are moving forward as a district. So we do want to thank you and your team um, for all the hard work. Um, we also want to thank what you started off with, all of our the years of service and um, that uh, our teachers have put in and the retirees have put in. Um, it just shows why Upper Dublin continues to be a great place um, for people to attend and learn and uh, try to be the best that they can be. So thank you again. I'm sure that as uh, the board um, reviews the presentations, they uh, will have additional questions and I'm sure they'll reach out to you at that point. Okay, we are now up to our first uh, community input session. Um, I want to um, please ask anyone that wants to comment to raise your virtual hand um, to state your name and where you reside in the township. Again, when you raise your hand, Ms. Evans will acknowledge you to speak as well as monitor the four minute time period that's allowed for individual comments. Ms. Evans, when you are ready, we can proceed. Uh, Ms. Brister, go ahead. Thank you, um, Anita Brister, Fort Washington. So I, I read through the agenda quickly an hour before the meeting and of course I saw that there was a demographic presentation. I didn't know there was a curriculum supervisor presentation. Um, just, I just wanna kind of ask, I mean, I'm really hoping that we're gonna have in-person meetings pretty soon, but it, it's helpful to me. And you, I think Dr. Yanni knows and, and Brooke knows I've been requesting to get some of the agendas ahead of time because it's, it's hard to process when I don't have stuff, but um, I don't know, I might have missed, I haven't, I did not attend the last couple of education meetings. So perhaps this was discussed there. But anyway, I have a ton of questions, but I'm, I'm just gonna have to keep it brief. And I have a bunch on the demographic too, because I had that was listed as a presentation, but the actual report was not there for the public. I guess what I wanna say is I'm trying to advocate to say, I like to ask 
somewhat informed questions and it's a little bit hard to do when I only have a few minutes to process from the presentation time to community input, but I'll do my best. So I kind of think the opposite. I can, I can see a district going either way on this. Um, I know some of these curriculum supervisors, believe it or not, some of them were there when a long time ago and when my kids were in school. I kind of like the idea of teaching and being a curriculum supervisor, but we'll put that aside for, for various reasons because you still have your hand in teaching. And I sometimes think people who just supervise get too far removed from the classroom. But let's put that aside for a minute. My question is more specific about, you listed six people that were teachers and curriculum supervisors. And then I believe you said Mrs. Vandergrift and somebody else, you'll have to refresh my memory, who's gonna do science and math. You said humanities K to 12 would be Brenna Vandergrift and somebody else is doing STEM. I don't know if that's Mr. Horn, perhaps. Um, but anyway, that leaves four people who had time in their schedule to be supervisors. And I didn't, Dr. Yanni, I didn't really hear you address what's happening to that time in the schedule. Does it mean, for example, they would teach more classes? You know, whether it's the Robbins Park person or whether it's uh, Mrs. Small, what happens to that time in the schedule? I would assume it, that that time defers back or defaults back to additional classes, but I didn't really hear how that's addressed. Um, and I guess what I wanna ask on the, demogra the demographic thing, which I'll have more questions after I actually read the report, is um, where's the, what's the position of the district on internal district projections. So I, you know, you guys know I, I have like a lot of history, but it used, it used to always be our business manager who you're saying is chief financial officer. I'm having trouble with all the different, you know, titles because for years it was a business manager, but for, for probably a decade, our business manager did the district's projections and they were based on um, retention rates from year to year, how many kids, you know, yes, the birth rates were used for kindergarten and then from birth to one, one to two, fifth grade to sixth grade, sixth grade to seventh grade was the retent, you know, historical, an average of the historical retention rates. Are we not going to use our own internal um, projections for enrollment? Because I think it's kind of important to look at all of them. All right, thanks. Thank you. Ms. Moore, go ahead. Hi, yes, yeah, so I'm actually in the North Penn School District, but I wanted to join you guys' meeting today to kind of introduce myself. So I am actually the new education chair for the AMBRA branch of NAACP. Um, so I'm representing myself behind, upon myself as well as the president, Sheikh Anwar Mohammed. Um, just trying to get familiar with the board along with the superintendent, Mr. Yanni, um, so that we now have a very active branch in Ambler and North, Upper Dublin and Wissahick and fall within our branch. So just trying to build the relationships so that we can, we can work together with different um, aspects within the district. Okay, thank you. Um, and just um, for the future, um, this first community input is really for um, just items that are on the agenda. We will have a second um, community input at the end, but it's nice to meet you. Thank you. Are there any other folks that want to comment? Go ahead, Ms. Burns. Hi, thanks, Brooke. Can you hear me? I sure can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is Lisa Burns from Fort Washington. I just wanted to um, tack on to Anita's comment again about the um, the in person, the option for in person school board meetings. Um, Dr. Davis, you had uh, told us back in the April legislative meeting that these meetings would go through June, um, and that 
The reason for that was that there were different rules that applied for the meetings, for the school board meetings. So I was hoping you could give us some um, more clarification on what those different rules are and what the current guidance is from the health department. Um, and then when you can project that we can start to have these meetings in person or an option to have them in person. Um, I agree with Anita that it's hard to retain a lot of this information on screen and go back and forth with uh, the, you know, uh, PowerPoint slides and, and following along. Um, and again, I've always said that I, I really think it would help our community to be back together, um, working together, listening together, questioning and answering together um, as one community. So if you could, Dr. Davis, please um, just fill us in on what those different rules are that apply to the school board meetings. And then um, when you project that we can um, count on um, in-person or at least options um, of in-person um, school board meetings, possibly in person as well as Zoom. Um, you know, a lot of things are moving forward. Kids are in school, um, things are being lifted. So I'd like to see the, the school board um, take steps to move us forward and not keep us stagnant um, with these board meetings. Thanks so much. Thank you. Are you seeing any other hands, Ms. Evans? I do not at this I do time. not either. All right, we're gonna bring this first community input session to a close. Um, I will, I think I'll turn it over to Dr. Yanni first to address um, the time in the schedule for the supervisors and the demographic study. Um, I'm also, um, before I turn it over to him, I just like to comment on um, the rules um, that are going to govern, um, you know, how we operate as a board and when we will come back uh, to face-to-face -face meetings. Um, the school board members um, have not met with the, um, the health department um, when you uh, mentioned, you know, where they stand and where we're going with that. They are, they will meet with the administration and then the administration um, will share that information with the school board. So I do not have any additional information at this time. Um, Dr. Yanni. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Um, there was a question about who will be taking on the STEM position, and that is Mr. Michener, Chris Michener, who's our associate principal at the high school. Um, and then there was also a question about, um, and now that these folks have time in their schedules, what will they be doing? Um, they will be teaching classes. Um, in the case of Lisa Fantini, um, really the only change for her is really a change from one employee group to another. Um, she'll continue teaching high school classes and then um, go over and uh, spend the rest of her day at Robbins Park. Um, one of the things that I have been careful about um, as we've um, reconfigured our administration is to look at ways that we can, as Mr. Sirota said, break the silos, um, work more collaboratively together, and also do it where we're not um, bumping folks out of jobs. So all of our curriculum supervisors will be going into positions um, that are, or will be teaching classes um, in their departments that would have otherwise been uncovered and we would have had to hire additional staff for. Um, <clears throat> in terms of internal uh, projections, um, I do internal projections on a regular basis as I'm planning um, and talking about the need for staff with uh, Ms. Kitten, our HR director, um, and that is based upon uh, retention rates. So um, that information is regularly shared with the board um, as we uh, get ready to um, staff for each, uh, for each year. Thank you, Dr. Davis. All right, thank you, Dr. Yanni. Okay, we're gonna move on to our announcements and communications. Mr. Lechman, is there anything this evening for the public? I do not have any announcements this evening. All right, thank you. Um, in terms of our minutes, 
Um, I'm looking for a motion from the board to approve the minutes from the May 17th uh, legislative meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Uh, Mr. Levinowitz, is there a second? Can I just clarify um, the, mean, the minutes we're looking to approve are from April 26th? Yes, from the April 26th. I'm sorry, I misspoke. May 17th is today. And assuming um, Art agrees. April 26th. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Levinowitz, if you can just um, clarify your motion to approve the minutes for April 26th. Dr. Levinowitz, are you muted? So moved. Okay. Now I will, I will second that motion. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sorota. Are there any questions or comments on the motion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Okay. The motion carries. Um, also included uh, this evening as an information item, we do have minutes from the April 7th Education Committee, the April 7th Policy Committee, and the April 22nd Finance Committee, which were approved by the committees and included as an information item. Ms. Sherpier, if you can present the recommendations for the Education Committee on the curriculum. Yes, thank you, Dr. Davis. Um, tonight we have a, a number of items on the agenda. I think um, item 8A is just information. Then I'd like to um, propose a motion to accept items 8B and 10A through G, and then leave H as a separate one. OK. Second. And who did the second? Mrs. Francis. Okay, Ms. Francis, thank you. Are there any questions on the motion? Okay, I don't see any hands. Um, all those in favor, favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. And then you have G. Uh, 10, 10 H, H, which is the mind up. Uh, since that was not discussed in education committee um, and um, was mentioned um, by Dr. Yanni earlier today, I figured we should take that separately. And I also want to note that this is funded by the Education Foundation. And I think we're very grateful for that opportunity. Um, so I'd like to propose to propose the motion to X accept the mind up program as well. Is there a second? A second. Was that Miss Ainiti? Yes. All righty. Are there any questions on the motion or comments? Yeah, I, I would actually have one question on that. The, the, the funding is for this coming year and the plan is for this coming year. What is the, is there a long-term plan for this, the, the program and in what form can we expect that and how would that be funded? The costs beyond the first year are minimal and they'll come out of the general fund. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you, Mrs. Sherpier. Um, next, we have our finance committee recommendations. Mr. Sirota. Thank you. We have 11 items under the finance recommendations. I'm going to break these up into groups. First up, I'd like to make a motion to approve items 11 A, B, and C, which are our regular monthly payments, financial reports, and budget transfers. Uh, B and C were discussed last week at the Finance Committee. A is new. Okay, uh, Mr. Sverda has made the motion. Is there a second? A second. Uh, Mr. Henderson, are there any questions or comments on the motion? Not seeing any hands. 
Okay. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Next up, we have item D, our proposed final budget for the 2021-2022 school year, uh, which as discussed last week, still includes a 3% placeholder for the tax increase for next year. We will revisit this uh, next month. Okay, there's a motion by Mr. Sirota. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Mr. Rofsky, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Thank you, the motion carries. Next step, I'd like to take item E by itself. And this is, uh, I'd like to make a motion to renew our property tax rebate program for the next fiscal year uh, with a 50% reimbursement rate relative to the state program. Thank you, is there a second? A second. Mr. Henderson. Thank you. Are there any questions to the motion? seeing any hands. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Thank you. All right. We have the next, I will take the final six items, F, G, H, I, J, and K. All six were discussed last week at the finance committee meeting. So I'd like to make a motion to approve these six. Thank you. There's a motion to approve those six items. Um, is there a second? I will second it. Uh, Mr. Rofsky, thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Are there aye. any Okay. <laughs> Are there any opposed? Thank you, the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Sirota. Uh, next, we have our personnel report recommendations, Dr. Levinowitz. Good evening, I'd like to make a motion to approve the entire personnel report tonight. Item one is compensation plans for six different groups within, within our district. Item B and C were referenced earlier tonight by Dr. Yanni. Item D is an MOU, which we uh, is very similar to what we did last year with our UDESPA. And then item E is the uh, personnel report itself. All right, Dr. Levinowitz has made a motion to approve all items under personnel. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Sarada. Are there any questions from the board on the motion? Seeing no hands, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Mrs. Franzek, um, the policy committee recommendations. Yes, thank you. I'd first like to take a, a, an opportunity to uh, make a motion to approve our second reading. So policies 204 attendance, 920 communications and 921 alcohol possession and use. These have all been extensively discussed at policy committee. Okay, on the second readings, do I have a second to the motion? Second. Okay, Mr. Wallach, thank you. Any questions? Seeing no hands, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Now, if I uh, may, I'd like to make a motion to affirm the first readings of policies 204, assignment to schools within the district, 216 student records, and 248 prohibited harassment by and of students also as discussed at policy committee. Okay, we have a motion to approve the, those first readings um, that she indicated. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Wallach, thank you. 
Are there any questions from the board? Sure. Sure. Okay. Okay. Seeing no hands, um, all those that are in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you, Mrs. Franzek. Um, we do have some other business on this evening. Mr. Wallach, if you will um, handle that. You're muted. Sorry about that. Thank you, Dr. Davis. We have one item of other business this evening. Uh, it's an annual motion with regard to the board's treasurer. Um, I make a motion to reappoint Jennifer Baldassano to be the board treasurer for a one-year term uh, beginning July 1st, 2021. Is there a second? A second. Mr. Henderson, thank you. Any questions to the motion? Seeing no hands, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion easily carries because no one else wants to do it. So thank you, Ms. Baldassano. All right. Um, we do have our liaison committee reports included as an information item. Um, this was a short month, so some of the um, um, committees and groups have not met yet. So they'll actually have a longer report next, next month. Um, but I want to thank everyone for getting those in. Um, we have a solicitor's report, Mr. Diazio. Yes, thank you, Dr. Davis, and good evening, everyone. Um, my solicitor's report this evening uh, will be the Sunshine Act announcements and um, the Sunshine Act announcement this evening is that the board met in executive session uh, tonight, May 17th, uh, prior to this public meeting. And the topics of the executive session included uh, matters of personnel, which were uh, approved as part of uh, tonight's public agenda, uh, matters of school safety pursuant to um, Act 44, Pennsylvania Act 44, um, and also um, to receive information regarding um, a matter of uh, litigation. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're ready for our second community input. Um, just as before, um, please state your name and where you reside in the township. Um, Ms. Evans will acknowledge you and monitor the four minute time limit. Ms. Evans, again, when you're prepared, you can call on anyone that has raised their virtual hand. Okay. Mr. Chabala, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, my name is Dr. Mark Chabala. I'm from the Maple Glen area. I was part of a group of parents that spoke at the school board meeting in September 2019. At the time, I was naive to think that students brave enough to plead their case for safer practice environment, along with actual data comparing Upper Dublin to other schools would convince the board to intervene. However, nothing changed after that meeting, even though many board members thought that a compromise should be met. What I learned, however, at that board meeting was that the only concern that the board members seemed to have were violations of school board or school district policy. So today I will take a different approach. The revision of policy 700 and 707 received full school board review at two separate board meetings. Shortly thereafter, in April through June of 2020, while the school district was shut down by state mandated order and during the same time frame that Andrew Lechman was unable to meet my request for various school documents, Dr. Yanni and officials were putting the final touches on an MOU that goes in direct violation of policy 700 and 707 and grants priority use of the natatorium to UDAC for every season of the year. I could find no record that the MOU was shared with the school board nor the public, so much for the Sunshine Law. Contrast that to an MOU that was signed in 2017 for Cardinal Stadium 
that received ongoing school board debate for nearly a year. The Cardinal Stadium MOU gives priority use to the high school football, soccer, band, and track teams. Following the high school programs, Upper Dublin Soccer, which donated $200,000, UDJAA, which donated $100,000, and Upper Dublin Township, also $100,000, are permitted primary use over other outside youth groups. In part of my ongoing efforts to understand the mystery of school districts and boards, I reached out to numerous other districts looking for policies on these taxpayer funded entities. What I found was that not only did nearly every single district in the state of Pennsylvania have a policy on the use by outside groups, but they have exact, they almost have all the exact same policies sometimes word for word. Many of them use the same numbers of 700 and 707. On further investigation, I was told by superintendents and school board members that there is a reason for those similarities and that is because state law mandates it. So I present to you public school code of 1949, section 775, which states, the board of school directors of any district may permit the use of its school grounds and buildings for social, recreational, and other purposes. It goes on to state the use, therefore, shall not interfere with school programs. It also has various fundraising mentions, which I will discuss at future meetings. I would, I would also hope that our school district solicitor, Edward Diasio, would be familiar with such state code as he previously served on the school board of North Penn and they are one of the districts that share this important information with me. I will again argue that the school board needs to intervene as school district officials continue to ignore board policy, administrative regulations, but most importantly, state law. During my investigation, I also spoke to various state officials with regard to violations of public school code, and I was informed that they take these violations very seriously. I hope our school board will do the same. Unfortunately, my time is running short, and I am happy to come back to future meetings to share the other numerous violations that I have uncovered. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. I, can, I don't see any other hands. Me either. Okay. Well, then I'll close um, our second community input at this time. Um, Dr. Yanni, I guess I'll turn it over to you for any comments. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Um, I was made aware over spring break that we had an issue with the scheduling of water polo. Um, since then, um, I've been working, and in fact, today I spoke with um, a member of the water polo boosters and also with our water polo coach about scheduling. And I indicated in that meeting um, a number of things. And in fact, said within the next week to 10 days, I would be having a meeting that I would facilitate, not the athletic director, not anyone else that I would facilitate um, between the coach of, uh, of our water polo team and um, any coaches um, or any coach from UDAC. Um, I believe that there should be equitable use of the pool. Um, policy 707 does say that school sponsored and district sponsored um, activities get uh, priority in scheduling. Um, I was made aware that um, a Saturday practice that had been a historical practice of water polo was not included in um, the schedule that was put to paper. So that is being rectified. Um, the other uh, piece that we need um, to rectify is looking at the pool in its totality. So there is a morning practice session, there's an after school session, and then there's also evening sessions. And I think if we lay out the three opportunities for folks to access the pool, whatever scheduling conundrum we continue to find ourselves in can be, can be rectified. Um, there is priority when something is um, district sponsored um, or school sponsored. Um, in the spring, uh, water polo and uh, UDAC, neither one of those things are district sponsored. So there's technically not a pecking order when um, allocating use of the pool. 
That being said, I do believe that um, there can be more equitable scheduling. Um, and so um, the water polo coach, um, a coach from UDAC and I will be meeting in the next week um, to look at the totality of scheduling the pool so that we can move forward. Okay, thank you. And I'm sure you'll keep us updated on as this progresses. Yes, I would expect um, no later than the next, um, probably the next finance meeting, but because it'll come up as a uh, facilities issue, um, I can provide an update if not before. Great, thank you. All right, um, we have um, in 19 Sunshine Act announcements, but Mr. Diazio has already given that. I see uh, Mr. Sirota has his hand uh, up. I'm missing it. Sorry. Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge in, in, in that comment, there was a, a, I would call a very serious accusation that the board has violated school code. Um, and um, I, I think that's some, I, we can't address it right here. That's, it's, you know, I, I, that needs to be reviewed, but I want to acknowledge that that serious accusation has been made. Uh, and uh, I trust we'll take a look at that uh, perhaps on the policy committee. Yes, I'll bring this to the next policy committee. I think there was also um, a statement that the administration is also violating school code, um, which I think is an equally serious uh, comment. So we'll bring this to the next policy committee as well. Thank you. Okay, any other comments scrolling through from the board? I don't see any other raised hands. Okay, um, just for information regarding upcoming meetings, um, on Wednesday, June 2nd at 6 p.m., we'll have our education committee meeting. Um, the policy committee will also occur on June 2nd at 7.15 p.m. or immediately following the education committee. We will have our finance committee on Thursday, June 17th at 6 p.m. And then our next legislative meeting will be Monday, June 21st at 20, uh, um, June 21st, 2021 at 7 p.m. Again, any other last comments from any of our board members or our superintendent? I'll scroll through to make sure I don't miss any hands. I would just like to say that um, I um, thank uh, everyone involved in planning our senior prom. I think senior prom uh, went off very well. I wanna thank everyone that has been involved with planning our junior prom. Junior prom uh, is coming up. And really I wanna uh, continue to thank our teachers and our students for their continued adherence to our health and safety plan. Uh, our goal is to uh, end the school year without interruption to uh, in-person learning. So uh, a huge thank you to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Duryani. At this time, it is, I believe, 8.30. And this meeting of the Board of School Directors is adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We look forward to seeing you at our meetings next month. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.